Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. This is a couple's journey into the mysterious, the unknown, and, and the, the paranormal. paranormal. I'm your host, Chris Carr. And I'm your host, Kristen Johnson. Together, Together we, we are Bigfoot, Bigfoot and, and the, the Bunny. Bunny. Welcome to Bigfoot and the Bunny. Happy Saturday. I'm your host, Chris Carr. Saturday, I am Kristen Johnson. And we're really psyched today. We're especially psyched uh, as a kind of last minute, um, some friends of ours, Shannon and MJ, invited us to go to the Conjuring House with them tonight uh, over in Harrisville, Rhode Island, which is actually pretty close to here. So we are grateful and thankful. Thank you, you. Shannon. Thank you, MJ, uh, for, for having us. And we'll be doing that after the show. And uh, taking some video footage, so hopefully we'll have some things to present on here. And hopefully, if you know all goes well, it'll end up in the documentary that we're working on uh, that we hope to have out by the fall. So that's pretty fantastic, and we're really excited. Uh, we have an amazing guest for you, and um, I'm gonna bring. Let me see here. I need my glasses. I need glasses. Can't see a damn thing. <laughs> Dr. Terry Simonson uh, is going to discuss his research and philosophy of the paranormal going back to ancient times. He notes that while there is nearly, nearly 150 years of scientific research in parapsychology, the field is still marginalized within academia. He also talks about his, the responses to the paranormal within the field, field of theoretical physics. His focus is on the practical applications of psi and the personal meaning of psi abilities. Now, we had uh, Terry on a year ago, and we had a great time talking to him. And uh, we got his book handy, as promised. Um, I said I was going to go out and buy it right away, and I did, did. and it's fantastic. So let's bring him right on. Good evening, sir. Good evening to you. (laughs) (laughs) It's wonderful to have you back. It's been about a year. I think a year ago, we were at the height of the no bird movement. <laughs> and yes, 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 I remember. The, the um, movement and push for uh, birds not being real. And that pigeons are liars. And uh, you confirmed for us that the birds in Norway, where you're from and are right now, are in fact real. Yes, they are. And their, uh, their poo are real. So you just have to ask any car owner and you will confirm the reality of birds. <laughs> it has since been discovered that the movement was a farce and mm. uh, birds are, are real here in the U.S. as well. Um, it was some talk about, I think, even their, their poop being uh, like GPS tracking or yeah. something like that. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. actually, it was an, um, it's Vice put it out. Um, there's a thing from Vice that uh, it's actually a, a pretty well um, thought out plan for what they did so indeed, mm-hmm. indeed. anybody wants to but uh yeah you know, we, we definitely had a few laughs and giggles about that yes and then we sorry. started to talk about your book and I, of course since that time I, I we bought the book uh read it love it and want to get into some other aspects that maybe we didn't cover the last time yes <clears throat> you mentioned uh consciousness quite a bit as playing a yes. role in psi abilities so maybe we could start there uh, yes, uh, say um, by by, by uh, say by habit we tend to think of consciousness as just something that I have inside my head and you have inside your head and our listeners have inside their heads. But um, uh, if we look at consciousness rather uh, not like just an individualistic thing, but rather like a collective field of information that we share, and therefore um, it's something like the internet. Uh, I use the concept the mental internet in my book. Then these phenomena uh, that seem so mysterious, like uh, for instance telepathy and clairvoyance, being able to see other places, being a- able to read other person's mind. Uh, if uh, consciousness uh, on a deep level is somewhat like the internet, then these uh, phenomena are not mysterious. Rather, it's something that should be ex- expected since, uh, after all, the field of consciousness is a shared entity. Uh, so when I'm thinking something, I'm putting it out there. And if you are sensitive, you will be able to pick that up. But just as um, 
with say the electronic internet uh, you have to have a good search engine and uh, so if you are have do have a good search engine then you are psychic you are able to somehow maneuver and navigate this mental uh, mental field so uh, that is that understanding of consciousness which is a very old thought but also a kind of very modern thought uh, that is some uh, crucial to uh, my approach to these phenomena because if consciousness is just inside my head and your head then telepathy real telepathy is not as least, least as i perceive it not possible but uh, the other way around if uh, which i think and so many great uh, ancient thinkers uh, have have uh, also thought and some modern uh, psychologists and uh, quantum physicists uh, that consciousness is a co collective shared field of information then these uh, phenomena are really to be expected because as i said we are deep deeply connected so agreed i, Absolutely. I fully think uh that you're spot on with the mental internet i love that uh, analogy um i think in a way hum humans in general are almost conditioned not to use those size senses that they already have and, mm. and expound upon them maybe simply because they don't believe that they exist uh parapsychology has done lots of experiments i know one of the ones you mentioned in your book involves twins from 2010 Oh, yes, that's a beautiful one. Shall I uh, recapulate it? So, uh, yes, that was a, a wonderful experiment. It was done in Denmark by an English professor in psychology. And also he is a great parapsychologist, uh, Professor Adrian Parker. And uh, there were, uh, he's tenured in Sweden, but this experiment was done in Denmark. And there um, <clears throat> were this couple of Danish twins, uh, twins uh, Sarah and Vicky. They were in uh, the late 20s, and they have always uh, felt a very strong telepathic connection. Uh, so uh, typically also one sister would go to the shop and buy, say, a piece of clothing, uh, a green blouse or something. Then the other would uh, also... Uh, totally independent of, of the first sister, go and buy a similar piece of clothing. So that had happened so often. They had decided that those who could show the bill with the earliest date stamp should keep the blouse and the other will have to go back and, and uh, you know, change it for something. Or, or, Turn or it. Not. Yes. So they were so closely connected in many ways, but of course they were uh, twins and also have been brought up together. So you could say, of course, if they were very sensitive to each other, you know, being very much in tune, shared genetics, shared milieu, uh, could that perhaps be the explanation for these, as I synchronistically uh, uh, very in-tuned activities of theirs. So uh, Professor P Parker uh, wanted to find out and he designed a quite an ingenious experiment. And um, one of the sisters uh, were set in an isolated room and uh, wired with, uh, say, equipment measuring heartbeat, measuring sweat response, you know, all these kind of bodily responses uh, that is uh, possible to read on meters. And then the other sister uh, was in a totally different room, shielded. I think it also, in fact, was electromagnetically shielded, not just sound and visually shielded, but also with uh, electromagnetism. So that was not possible with any kind of normal uh, communication between the sisters. So uh, this sister, uh, then we have the setup here. The one sister is wired with all this equipment. The other sisters has agreed to uh, get four mild shocks. And uh, that uh, say point in time for those shocks were randomized. It was a computer, not a human being, uh, who was to decide when the shocks was given, because uh, otherwise it would be possible to make appointments and cheat, or even just by subconscious uh, intuning, perhaps uh, guess when these shocks would be given. But as sure. I said, it, it was uh, randomized. Uh, the computer gave a signal, and then that would be given a shock. And what was so, say, crazy about this was that the one sister getting the shock, immediately it was 
possible to see spiking on the meters uh, on the other sister. So it was, that is a short version. We can, of course, discuss there are some interesting philosophical details about it also. But clearly, uh, it seemed to be a hotline between them. So one sister getting the shock, the meters on the other sister spiking immediately. So that, to me, was a very strong, uh, say, uh, uh, what is called evidence for, uh, say, what has been uh, hypothesized about this mental internet, this connection, this uh, collective field of consciousness connecting us all on, on a deep level. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I love that example. Uh, it's great. And I think um, they use different, they use like cold water, they used uh, yes. electricity, different yes. shocks. And the, the really, the kicker in there is that the other person, the other twin felt it just slightly before it actually happened right yes that is uh, that is uh, the philosophical aspect of it which complicates the things uh, in a way but it's also very interesting uh, thinking about the nature of uh, of psi phenomena because as you said when for instance um, one of the shocks was uh, electricity on a on a finger she had a kind of uh, metal ring on the finger and it would would be induced uh, uh, a little electric shock and what was wondrous uh, was not only that the meters on the other sister spiked but that they spiked say a couple of seconds before the shock was given. So, say, uh, if we are into the Psy world here, which is not, uh, say, normal world, uh, then we have not only telepathy going on, but even precognition, uh, because it uh, the, spi uh, the spike happened a bit before. Of course, skeptics will say, aha, there you have faulty equipment, you have some kind of dodgy things going on. But in fact, many experiments with Psy have that nature. It's not always to isolate a Psy phenomenon, because if you somehow dissolve the matrix of time and space we usually uh, operate within, then these phenomena uh, tend to somehow be chaotic with uh, relation uh, precisely to sp space and time. And as I said, therefore, it should be possible to also detect these shocks uh, slightly before they happened, because our linear time is probably not the deepest, uh, say, truth about the nature of time. I think it's a human experience. It's just part of being, you know, in the, this three-dimensional world that we live in. Yes. Uh, the whole concept of linear time and the math yes. shows, and although I can't personally do the equations, that it, it can, it's not really there. Um, I know that Dr. Dean Radin of the Institute of Noetic Sciences has done similar experiments where uh, people would be focused on a computer or like a laptop and they're measuring their skin and there's a, a response. I think the skin tightens or something. There's a, yeah, a physical yeah. response when you see something that is emotionally provoking, like a kind of disturbing image. And they would watch different images, um, you know, and randomly have, you know, these kind of disturbed, whether it's war or something like that, <clears> a picture. And the same effect happened where mm. the people, before that image came up, just in the milliseconds before, they had the physical reaction mm. to what was they were about to see. Yes, uh, the, uh, Dr. Raiden used three different types of images there. Uh, it was, say, um, uh, <laughs> scary images, neutral images, and pleasant, pleasant images. And uh, what, uh, uh, just as you said, uh, about three seconds before, uh, say a scary picture uh, would be shown at um, at the screen and again it was randomized uh, it was the computer deciding when these pictures were seen so it was not possible to make kind of deal in beforehand between the experimenter and the staff and uh, uh, and the subject uh, so uh, that's uh, you could see the responses uh, uh, on the person before uh, the scary uh, image appeared on the screen. Uh, when the neutral uh, uh, image appeared, of course, that was neutral. So then you was not able to see anything. Uh, when the pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, there was also possible to see an, a reaction in advance, but that was not so strong as with the scary picture. And from an evolutionary perspective, that makes quite good sense because, um, for instance, if you see a beautiful person of... Uh, of the opposite sex, uh, it, it, somehow that it could be, of course, a mate. Uh, but 
what is even more important is to escape the lion that wants to to kill you anyway. So scary stuff is really say extremely important for survival and then you will hopefully meet this pleasant other person and can mate later when the lion is away so so it's so important uh, from an evolutionary perspective that we have these abilities and um, i think they have served us quite well and uh, uh, raiden did his experiments uh, to some extent with uh, soldiers and of course if you are out in the field you know and there could be exploding grenades or whatever you know if these uh, things are working for you um, then it's much more likely that we, you have a better chance to survive on the battlefield. And uh, also um, the military, uh, US military use, had a um, program called Stargate, where they for 20 years used uh, or tried to train uh, spies uh, to use clairvoyance, uh, remote viewing is, uh, as it was called. There. And um, then they used as test subject uh, or trainees, um, they used soldiers that have escaped uh, impossible situations uh, on the battlefield because the they hypothesized that uh, the reason that uh, they had survived was they have uh, well-developed uh, abilities of these kind we are talking about. Uh, I can mention just a little thing. Uh, uh, what uh, Raiden used uh, was um, measures skin conductivity. And what uh, happens if you are scared, you sweat uh, microscopic uh, sweat drops. And uh, that, say, moist on your skin will make it more permeable to, to electricity. And that was in uh, the radiance equipment that was what he measured okay that's what it was it, it's been a while since i read about those studies yeah, yeah, yeah. i do recall it was like a skin response yes and, uh, yeah fascinating stuff fascinating stuff. very fascinating now that's modern uh parapsychology looking at things but the thoughts about this and consciousness go way back to people like emmanuel kant right Yes, that is interesting because uh, Emmanuel Kant, uh, if uh, uh, <clears throat> our listeners have studied uh, some European philosophy, he was, uh, say, the king of Enlightenment philosophy. Uh, and he was in Germany and uh, he is very famous for... Uh, three critiques. Critique is not a critique in 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 this uh, say negative sense, being critical, but it's a more an assessment. And one of uh, the uh, most the most famous one of those critiques um, uh, is critique der rein Vernunft, uh, uh, the critique of pure reason. And that is really a theory about some aspect of consciousness. And one say central idea uh, from Kant is that time and space are not real in themselves. It, they are created more or less by our consciousness. It gives us somehow a matrix wherein we can place what we um, experience. For instance, uh, take uh, just to make an example, a car crash. Uh, if you are to understand uh, the where uh, and, um, say the whereabouts about a car crash. You have to say where did it happen? That is space, and when did it happen? That is time. And also, there is a third very important uh, determinator here. It's causality. What was the reason or the reasons behind this? And that is how we organize our world. And Kant uh, had uh, uh, say. <clears throat> Uh, uh, thought that the, this sphere in German is called Ding für mich, meaning the things for me. But the other sphere uh, outside this matrix uh, is called Ding an sich, the thing for itself, the things for themselves. So he makes a very sharp division between what is the, the world of experience, which is conditioned by these categories as he's called them and and uh, the world outside these which it's very difficult to know something about but as he he's written a very interesting letter about that uh, and he mentioned a very famous um, say demonstration of clairvoyance and then it seems to be possible to transcend this matrix of space and time. I don't know if you want to, me to recapitulate that uh, famous experience of clairvoyance sure. or... Absolutely. Okay. Yes, there was a famous Swedish scientist, Emanuel Swedenborg, and uh, some uh, quite a number of followers in the US uh, uh, for his spiritualistic uh, 
uh, life view. But he was uh, basically a natural scientist. Uh, and he had the experience in being in one town. And suddenly he, uh, and there was lots of ambassadors and as I uh, the the Bell Society present, you know, lots of witnesses, and suddenly he felt um, an urge to leave the party. Went outside, and he came back very pale. And he described that uh, there was um, fire going on uh, in in Stockholm, uh, and that was many many miles away from the town uh, he was. Uh, they were in this party, he, and he described to a T uh, how that uh, fire developed, and also uh, uh, described exactly where it stopped. And you know, this was before the mobile phone and even before the telegraph. We are now back in, uh, I think it was about 70, 65 or like that. I don't remember ex the exact year for, for the experience, but long before any say kind of distant communication of the electronic kind. So uh, yeah. three days later, they got a kind of um, uh, what is called uh, an what is the uh, emissary from from this uh, Stockholm uh, informing uh, uh, them about what had happened and what this emissary said was just uh, as uh, Mr. Swedenborg had described. And as I said, it was not possible at all to communicate in a normal way on that distance in, in these days. And also there were lots and lots of witnesses. And Emmanuel Kant, he sent one of his friends and uh, say inquiry these witnesses and they confirmed yes it happened just exactly like that so this for uh, Kant seemed to be a kind of uh, opening uh, so it, in our day-to-day -day life we are closed into this matrix of, of the space and time but in kind of uh, altered state of consciousness which uh, Swedenborg seems to have very easy access to it's possible to transcend and go into uh, go from Ding für mich to more into the Ding an sich the the thing in itself, which is not limited in the same way by space and time uh, as our uh, normal life. And Sw Swedenborg has made a lot of spiritualistic philosophy about it and how souls communicate and all that stuff. Kant did not not necessarily buy all the spiritualistic things, but he say, bought the experience the reality of clairvoyance because of course it's possible to frame these kind of experiences probably you can even be a materialist and believe in clairvoyance you don't need to be a spiritualist or if you are spiritually oriented you can be a buddhist or a hindu or a kabbalist or sufi or whatever so so uh, he kant didn't buy necessarily swedenborg's uh, philosophy spiritualistic philosophy but he was uh, totally convinced about the reality of uh, his clairvoyance I love that because it, you can't cheat, if you will. You know, this happened in a time where people just you couldn't pick up a phone and say, oh, this happened, or there's really no workaround. No you know, work you around. would have had to have had psychic abilities to know that and to the level of detail that he did, especially. Yes. He, descri he described uh, almost to the meter where the fire had stopped and uh, wow. described the name on the house. And it, it's, it's crazy uh, accuracy, really. Being at that time, too, you said it was in the 1700s, middle 1700s. Being at that time, um, you would think they, that he would have been persecuted as being a witch or or something, you know, because that's what they felt like at that time. Well, uh, he would probably not have been persecuted as a witch, but rather is as an ignoramus or obscurantist, because not now we have entered the age of enlightenment. And, you know, witches, by definition, did not exist in the enlightenment. So it would uh, not being a heretic, but rather being irrational would be the charge against him. Right. He would have been considered an, a nut. You yes. Know. And yes. then later we would start to move into things like the spiritualist age. Right. In the 1800s, and uh, you know, you, you could come under even more fodder, but people were still doing experiments. The Psychical uh, Society in, in uh, London and the American so uh, Psychical Society started, I think, in Boston and the U.S. Uh, they mm -hmm. were doing experiments with um, what they called it, I, I think, psychic drawing. Then would later be coined as remote viewing by Ingo Swan, if I'm not mistaken, in mm -hmm. the 70s. But um, one of Ingo's books, he actually gives a lot of the examples of the drawings and things they did. And that's where 
to be an object out of their reach and in a laboratory setting or out of their sight and everything else, possibly in the same room with them, like high up on the ceiling, but a hidden mm-hmm. the person would have to draw it. And it was crazy how great some of these drawings are. And they were mm. really spot on to whatever the objects were. Mm. So it's been studied for a long time. Oh yes, there's a quite uh, quite uh, impressive work done on that. Uh, uh, but a, a problem, of course, is that you, uh, you if you are, if you are going to uh, that, what skeptics say, uh, oh, they could have been paid to say this, you know, or there could be kind of loyalty because uh, uh, the wife of the medium was, uh, you know, beholden to this and anything. So there is always kind of ad hoc explanations to get away from these things, uh, as long as you are not willing to consider that. You your paradigm might be limited uh, and uh, and uh, basically wrong. Uh, people are usually not uh, open to somehow uh, expand their horizon to include these kind of impressive results. That's right. And then skepticism is healthy. You know, we we need it in uh, in the paranormal, and we need Absolutely. it certainly in science. Um, but there, <clears throat> some skeptics go pretty far. I think you mentioned a great Randy in your book as well. Oh yes, yeah. I, I think he was a cheat. Uh, he was a, basically a magician, and he's mostly fa- most famous for having promised one million dollars to uh, anyone who would be able to to prove to him that the paranormal, some paranormal phenomena, uh, was, was real. Uh, but you know the conditions for the competition that uh, uh, he had somehow to agree on the result, and uh, there was some lots of dodgy conditions in in, in the competition. There. So, uh, and there was in fact a very famous Dutch professor and also physicist, um, uh, Biermann, uh, Dr. Biermann, and he challenged uh, Randy. Uh, to 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 participate in some of his experiments where they use brain scanners to 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 detect telepathic transmission and so but suddenly Randy just skipped the whole thing and didn't communicate with him uh, so you know he it was kind of as I said he was a magician he was a showman and that was just kind of stunt career stunt to me I, I, I don't consider it a serious condition and I know per, uh, say serious psychologists they don't believe in 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 Randy's uh, say honesty or, or, or being willing to admit even if some even if he had seen a ghost in the right before him he would say oh it's just a 3d projection from some kind of holographic machine or whatever you know so yeah sure yeah 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 yeah, uh, very controversial in a way. Uh, certainly, I, I, I don't. Uh, some skeptics I, I like, you know, but uh, I don't like Randy because I feel he's not honest, and uh, he is also. Uh, I mentioned that in my book also because there were some experiments done in a very serious laboratory, and then he had two assistants uh, going undercover there and uh, say pretend to be participating in the experiments but they were really u- using magic tricks and suddenly randy went out public and said oh sir we have got this laboratory to claim they have proven paranormal phenomena but if you read the reports from the laboratory that's not the case at all it's just a scam so so randy is not my kind of skeptic you know great physicists of course they have a strong skeptical component because you should not believe in anything that is not true uh, of course you should but Randy, he was not a skeptic. He was a denier or a pseudo skeptic, in my understanding, at least. Yeah, yeah, no, we uh, we agree with you. And yeah, uh, so when we talk about the paranormal or uh, parapsychology laboratory studies, they go through great lengths to you know uh, maintain scientific controls, they know, do. measurements, and-, and measurements. And we know mm-hmm. uh, a, a yes. person, Gail Heisen, is the host of Small Medium at Large, is another mm-hmm. podcast out there we like and we're friends with her um was uh, one of the people that would be participating with dean in some of the experiments that he did uh-huh. and, uh, there's a crazy amount of scientific controls in those experiments they're not just oh, yes. fake or really you know skew the results of no, uh, as they say, and even uh, the, the most uh, famous skeptic uh, or the two great skeptics in, in Britain, and one of them is uh, psychology professor Chris French, and he also was editor for the Skeptic magazine, and he says, and, and as I said, he's an arch-skeptic himself, and he says uh, some of the experiments uh, 
of uh, of parapsychology is even are even better uh, controlled than say normal psychological experiments. So uh, and uh, so he is quite. Uh, impressed by the rigorosity of the parapsychologist's way of dealing with these phenomena. But uh, the, what is, should be understood, as I said, uh, when we discussed uh, the experiment, uh, Ellen Parker, the twin telepathy, uh, the, uh, psi might be of a nature that not uh, necessarily, say, uh, <laughs> resembles our expectation uh, because as i said if you twist with time what comes before could uh, come uh, after what comes after and all that kind of things you know it's difficult to use a normal protocol so that is a challenge and also if there is possible for instance to have telepathic exchange not just between the two persons doing say an experiment say one tries to project a figure into the mind of another but then you have lots of laboratory assistance for instance also and if they are say really into the experiment they also will strongly project images that might be perceived by by the persons uh, taking part in the experiments so uh, isolating things so that you have say a rigorous protocol for psi experiments is, uh, is rather difficult but as i said also chris french is uh, kind of impressed the, the way uh, the parapsychologists deal with this and he says uh, that they are at, at par with or even better than normal psychology very often. Yeah, I, we, we've heard that actually. And the use of things like Faraday cages are, yes. around the, the subjects to prevent, you know, radio mm. transmissions like uh, people in the paranormal would use like a, you know, a spirit box. You might put that in a little Faraday bag, Faraday bag. to mm. prevent, you know, radio yes, from do. coming through it and just mm. uh, let the... May, may, may I men, uh, also a very uh, interesting experiment uh, for healing uh, 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 intention at distance. I don't know if you remember that from a book, the ha Hawaii experiment. Uh, may I recapitulate that as well? Please, yes. Yes. Uh, they did uh, at a hospital in Hawaii, they did experiment. They had uh, 11 healers with uh, 11 patients and uh, each healer could choose his or her patient, you know. And then the patient was put in a brain brain scanner, uh, so you could read uh, all what happens uh, in the different brain waves uh, of this patient. And also this room, uh, as I said, it was done in a hospital in Hawaii, and the room was not only uh, say visually shielded or audit, uh, auditively shielded, but also electromagnetically shielded. So it would not be possible to have a, a little radio or like a kind of device uh, communicating between the healer and the patient. So uh, the, the protocol for the experiment was that uh, the healer was to send good vibes, good healing intentions to the patients for a period of some seconds and then pause and then send more healing good intentions and then pause and then send more you know so you had sequence with uh, sending healing and pausing sending healing and pausing and uh, the the the, the uh, say the conductor of the experiments was dr uh, jan uh, achtenberg she is professor she has passed away uh, regrettably but uh, she was professor in psychology and she said that in 11 uh, in 9 out of 11 uh, cases it was possible to see very clearly on the screen when the healing was sent and when the healing uh, was paused. And wow. she described it a very, uh, I like to uh, say, metaphor she used. He, she said the patient's brains were um, elighted like Christmas trees, you know. You wow. could see, yes. So, and uh, that was nine out of 11 cases. And then uh, they were evaluated statistically afterwards. And I think they said for this to happen by coincidence, it would be just a chance of one out of 5,000 or even less. So, yeah. Yeah, I always think it'd be even greater than that. That's that's amazing. Uh, it statistically, is. it would be, you know, how do you replicate that kind of thing? Yes, and we have a Dr. Ostenberg, and we had Dr. Raiden, and we had a Dr. and Professor uh, Adrian Parker. There's uh, people with impeccable uh, academic uh, credentials doing these experiments. And also, I would like to mention, if uh, I'm talking a bit too much, so just stop me. <laughs> so, um, but uh, people, uh, you know, I discuss sometimes with skeptics, and they say, oh, but there are no uh, kind of serious stuff in serious uh, psychological 
journals about this and so uh, why is that if these things are real and so and i said but uh, you are not updated because the most prestigious psychological journal in the world is uh, normally thought to be american psychologists that is released uh, and even is the flagship journal of the apa the american psychological association and right. in the may issue of a 2018, there was an article by Professor Etzel Cardenia. It's called um, uh, The Experimental Evidence for Parapsychological Phenomena. And uh, he, uh, as I said, this article is in the most prestigious psychological journal in the world. And he uh, concludes, uh, just to sum it up, he concludes that, yes, several of these phenomena are real and supported by experimental evidence. But uh, no, we have not yet reached an explanatory model that everybody can agree uh, uh, on. So there you have it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you look at things like quantum physics, uh, yes. which are tossed around a lot, especially in the paranormal field, without yeah. any real explanation of what, what they're talking about. Right. And string theory, and when you talk about multi-dimensions and, and different mm. timelines and that kind of thing, I feel like science is slowly catching up. Uh, you mentioned quantum physics and uh, bilocation mm. and, uh, in, in your book, yes. um, as well as quantum entanglement. Maybe we could yes. talk a little bit about that in, in simplistic terms so people can understand that or are interested in this because I hear yes. this excuse, you know, oh, it's just got to be quantum physics, you know what I mean? Like a blanket statement with... Without a <laughs> yes, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, uh, to me, the phenomena is, uh, uh, is what is the most important phenomena in themselves. But uh, you, uh, so uh, as they say, a different set of data can be uh, explained within different models. So um, I will not say uh, that I know which model of consciousness is the right one. Uh, and also, uh, there are also different, uh, I think it's eight basic interpretations of, of quantum physics. Uh, so uh, which one is, say, most relevant for Psy Richards? I will not say uh, I have some personal favorite, but I cannot say that this model is the right interpretation of quantum physics and this one is wrong or so on. But uh, one experiment that is very famous that seems to indicate, uh, seems to suggest um, <clears throat> that, for instance, a phenomenon like telepathy uh, might have a, say, um, good scientific explanation uh, is, uh, for instance, what is usually referred to as the aspect uh, experiment. It's uh, named after a French physicist called Alain Aspect. Uh, and to make it just simple, it is um, if you have a kind of uh, what is called a nuclear accelerator, uh, like they have in CERN in Switzerland, for instance, you can collide uh, uh, elementary particles. And in this uh, uh, aspect experiment, uh, they collided uh, two electrons boom, like that. And when uh, these electrons collide, uh, there will be created uh, uh, particles of light, photons. And since they are born, uh, they will be created two photons in this uh, collision here. And <clears throat> Since they are born at the same time, it's usually called twin photons. And what uh, happens is uh, when these electrons collide, it creates these photons and they are hurtling uh, uh, away to opposite sides like that, like four kilometers and kilometers. And what is really wondrous is uh, then, the, and this has been uh, measured in at least three laboratories, uh, different places in the world. If one of those twin photons, uh, say, is measured going uh, downwards, the twin twin will be uh, going upwards. If one uh, is uh, measured going uh, rightwards, the other will go left. And if it's the, the first one is going up, the other one will go down. So they mirror each other completely. And that is even if they are kilometers away from each other, they still work as a unit being in some way connected, even by normal understanding of space, they are totally, uh, say, split apart. And as I said, the movements mirror each other. So it's, it, they are a kind of, uh, uh, say, unit. It, we perceive them perhaps as two 
uh, different photons. But as I said, basically, it is a unit, and thereby um, these phenomena could be explained perhaps by uh, superstrings and that kind of things. But if we now think along these lines and say, okay, that, that might not uh, just be uh, photons working in that way. Maybe our consciousness is working in the same way. So when something happens, in, with, if I meet a person, we have a strong exchange emotionally and we split apart. And perhaps we still are connected on some level. So if that person, for instance, uh, experiences strong feeling of joy or strong feeling of terror, I will be able to that because we have become entangled in that meeting, just like the photons. At least it's a, a very um, uh, thrilling metaphor. And I think it might be very uh, see, indicative of how things are working. Absolutely. I, I love that. And thank you for that explanation. And people have to, to remember, and you said this at the front of the, the show, about consciousness. I, people have a tendency to think about it in their head, in their brain, yes. physically in their mind. But there's so much more on a cellular level. You have examples of uh, people that get heart transplants and the emotions of the person they got that yes. the heart came from seem to carry on in the, in the new person that has the heart and that mm. sort of thing. So the, the memory isn't necessarily everything is not necessarily stored in the mind. We have to exactly. think outside of that box and it might be bigger than that. You mentioned uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Uh, in your book, yes, and we love Rupert. We love he talks Rupert about children. morphic re resonance, and yes, yes, uh, Rupert is famous for say relaunching in a modern version uh, uh, kind of uh, theory of uh, evolution that is traditionally called uh, Lamarckism after uh, an other a French theorist that had some kind of. Um, uh, theory. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, French uh, in in uh, in the 18th century, and uh, he um, said that uh, hereditary, uh, say, uh, abilities, capabilities can can be say transmitted to 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 <laughs> later generations uh, but he had no good explanation for how that could happen uh, of course uh, you can see um, there is uh, this ostrich uh, african ostrich it has, has kind of thick skin on its belly uh, a little pillow that is, is helpful uh, when it uh, lays on or, or on the sand. Uh, but how that has developed, because it's not a matter of survival. It seems more a matter of, of pleasure or <laughs> what you can say. Uh, so, so um, there are so, so many, say, rational thing in nature that seems they are placed there with and some kind of intention. But how nature has been able to do that, that Lamarck could not explain. But uh, Sheldrake has uh, launched his theory of, of uh, morphic uh, fields. And he says that, for instance, if you have crocodiles, uh, and the crocodiles do exp uh, uh, have experiences of uh, hunger, of uh, mating, of uh, swimming, or whatever. And then uh, all this information that the crocodiles and the baboons and the elephants and the tigers and uh, every kind of animal, but uh, this kind of um, information field related to one species will expand uh, over the years and it will contain more and more and more and more and more information about that species. And when that, say, memory bank is full, the account is full of valuable memories, then it may, on some, um, for, for different reasons, there may be triggered a beneficial mutation. Very many of the mutations in nature are not beneficial. You know, you can get these uh, kind of uh, deers with two, two large horns and, uh, you know, so it's not necessarily beneficial. But this account of... Um, uh, say experience, uh, which uh, Sheldrake calls morphic fields, uh, they have somehow um, increased the possibility uh, for a mutation to become beneficial. So it will not be uh, development, but it will be evolution, uh, develop further. So, um, and say the, the world is somehow going towards higher and higher consciousness, higher and higher of a level of sophistication of, of consciousness. So that is what we see. Okay, you can be, be a Christian, you can be a Buddhist, you can be a Pantist, you can be an atheist, but still, I think most people with somehow seen, uh, somewhat scientific mind will agree that life has started as uh, on Earth, 
at least, uh, started as small microbes in, in, in the, um, say, primordial sea. And then we are suddenly here some million years after, you know. It's an extreme, extreme, extreme um, evolution that has happened for coming from amoeba in, in this uh, primordial sea to complex human beings, space traveling beings even. So, so uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to explain how is that, uh, because an, a, a microorganism, why should it start developing at all? It's quite happy where it is, you know. It, it feeds on whatever is available and has no really impetus to, to develop. But if it is, like Sheldrake suggests, then when millions and millions and uh, microbes have had experiences, they will generate this field of consciousness. The memory bank will expand, and after some million years, it will be enough uh, information there to kick off a kind of beneficial, um, say, leap in, in evolution. So I think his explanatory model makes very lots of sense. And I met his thoughts when I was a student. Uh, he has uh, two books and uh, the second book uh, was, it's called The Presence of the Past. And I think the title says it all, that the past is not past, it's present in the form of the information in these morphic fields. And it's just out there. He talks a lot about um, household pets and their telepathic connection to their owners. Yes. And I, I know he's gone through great lengths in, in, to study this in the most, you know, in ways that kind of defeat that, well, the dog just here's the car kind yes. of thing. And he's talking about dogs, cats, even parrots uh, was yes. a very good example. And um, he would randomize the times the owners came home, how yes. they came home, sent people home in cabs. And statistically, the animals know, they always know, especially the parrot, knows when, <laughs> apparently, uh, it, it was, it was kind of an interesting story about the parrot, um, when the owner is coming home, like mm. there was a telepathic connection, and it couldn't be explained away as simply as they have better hearing, and they they just no. know, or they're used to a certain exactly. kind of uh, what, 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 uh, uh, just to, 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 to uh, mention the morphic fields again, uh, this information, uh, if this is a, a collective, uh, not individualistic process. But uh, as you say, um, this seems to be a telepathy uh, is somehow using the same route as the uh, morphic fields uh, generating information. Uh, so um, it is kind of what the nature does on kind of unconscious uh, level just as seems to be a function in nature itself we as humans uh, or even our pets is uh, are able to, to do with a more say uh, uh, individual intention uh, one uh, i mentioned that experiment with this telepathic terrier jt should i uh, mention that sure yes um, yes uh, that is um, uh, uh, one of the most famous uh, experiments Sheldrake made. Um, there was a woman, uh, Pat Sp uh, Smart, and she had a, a, a terrier called JT. And when she came home from town, it would always or nearly always uh, be in the window, uh, on the window, waiting for her. Uh, and uh, just as you said, um, uh, the, uh, Sheldrake uh, was uh, connected to this case and uh, wanted to check it out and uh, went to great lengths. So he installed uh, cameras uh, so it was possible to see uh, the dog's movement even if there were no person present in the room. And what they saw was when uh, Spam, uh, no, <laughs> Pam, not Spam, sorry, uh, Pam went into, for instance, the bus down in town or into the taxi, or into the car, you know, uh, say, taking the action to getting home, then the dog uh, about would start to move towards the window. And a, a statistically very strong uh, support for, for this. And when she did not go uh, enter the vehicle, uh, the dog would just, you know, stroll along and do whatever dogs does when they are home alone. So, so it was so, okay. uh, and uh, yes, and uh, 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 he has filmed uh, these cases and he has even filmed not one case, but hundred cases with this dog, you know, so very strong evidence for this uh, tire to be telepathic. Yeah, I agree, and I, I'm familiar with that. And uh, like I mentioned, the, the parrot, the parrot was interesting because the parrot was only two generations out of being uh -huh. wild. You know, yeah. where dogs and cats, they're 
They're kind of the bread, domestic, domestic right. domesticated. The pat, parrot's only two generations out from being a wild bird. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very fascinating that it just has that natural ability to know, seemingly to know the intentions of, of its owner. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I've heard so many, many stories by uh, in our local little town here, you know, because I discussed uh, these theories with, say, people being interested. And, oh, yes, always when I come home from work, uh, some, my, my mom and daddy told me that my, my, my dog uh, immediately runs to, to, to the front door. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when uh, if I, for some uh, reason, is delayed, the dog will also be delayed going to the door. So it's not just coming home at the same time or like anything like that, you know seems to be a direct hotline uh, between the pet and the owner. Absolutely. And, and it gets down to those intentions. Uh, yes. Frank Wen from the, the wizard's table, the wizard's table, had an interesting comment here. He says, I remember once I got into an altered state of consciousness and met with a very powerful entity. And this entity told me something very simple and very true. Quote, all things are connected all the time. Yes. And uh, Ken is a sorcerer, so he's dealing with things like intentions and magic and mm. uh, in change in a world really through one's intentions or connecting with other entities to help those connections come mm. to fruition, those intentions. Right. Yes. So I think that's an interesting comment because all this stuff seems very tied together. Um, it is. And uh, as I said, we discussed some int uh, possible interpretation of quantum physics. And one uh, I am quite fond of is the holographic principle that was launched by David Bohm, a uh, great American uh, physicist that went to England. Um, because he was a bit had some socialist sympathies and it was uh, McCarthy time you know in the US and it was not possible to to have any kind of say even if Santa Claus have you know had red costume was suspicious suspect you know so uh, so but uh, David Bohm went to England and he had this holographic principle that uh, the world is basically created is a great hologram where every little piece of um, the, 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 the hologram has information about all the rest of of the hologram you know as they say the droplet uh, mirrors the universe and i think that that's also um it's called uh, the net of indra in in uh, hindu tradition you know it's uh, like a golden net with with uh, cut crystals in in the nodes of the net and all the uh, 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 what is called facet uh, facets of the crystals are ref reflecting the whole net and all the other crystals you know so it's a mirror in mirror in mirror in mirror in mirror in mirror you know all all around so uh, i think some it's difficult to express scientifically this but uh, uh, the hologram is kind of uh, say close to how they understand it, it, bones understanding how the world works and in fact the first version of my book was um, uh, was uh, released by a little english publisher in italy called pari publishing and that was um, created by a quantum physicist david pete who had been working together with david boom for boom for many years so the holographic principle seems to to uh, if you have that kind of uh, interpretation of quantum physics, it seems to, uh, say, make a, a good case for that everything is connected and everything is some, it, it's not just one connection from A to B, it's, you know, it's a network of connection. Uh, I, I, I made an, if you have my book here, could you show the book yes you see the the net the golden network uh, that symbolizes this connection yes the golden network and it's a very complex everything being connected to everything else you know yeah i, I would agree and, and yeah, that's also that. something sheldrake talks about not in others mm -hmm. about the patterns within patterns so it's almost like yes. a, a perspective yes. you know uh, yes. from one perspective we just see we can see patterns in our nature and our universe yes. but when we look under a microscope we see the same kind of patterns but we see things we can possibly you know see otherwise through our normal senses and if mm. we go back and you pull back and look at the universe you start to look mm. at solar systems and then galaxies and the universe itself mm. these yes. same patterns keep turning up but yes. of course we can't see them it doesn't mean that they don't exist so there no. has to be some sort of connection Yes, uh, uh, probably very famous uh, yeah. scientific uh, book about this. It's called, uh, it's by French uh, Jewish theorist uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, this fractal ge geometry of nature. That is uh, 
what uh, would you say for instance the spiral you find the spiral in you know in uh, in the stellar uh, nebulous you know the, there's the spirals and you find the spiral in in uh, in your dna you know uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the the helix so the spiral is a fractal you know it's uh, uh, self repetitive on uh, on different scales you know and you find there also lots of other kind of fractals you know structures that are self similar in 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 different sizes and so so uh, uh, and uh, to me at least this seems to go very well together with the holographic principles you know uh, uh, where a structure is repeated and repeated and repeated uh, all through the hologram it's extremely complex doing the mathematics for this uh, i tried to read some of the stuff and uh, i understand some of it but not all i have to admit so but uh, right. at, 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 yeah. yeah and the beauty of it is you don't have to be able to do all the equations to know it you know the end result is and what it kind of means and points mm. to you know string theories like that as well right and, and these multi-dimensional things i i don't i couldn't possibly begin to i wouldn't know where to start with some of the the math that is behind exactly. them but i can understand when they say okay there's 11 dimensions and here's what happens mm. starts to become irrelevant after five and yeah yes. yeah yes it's, it's fascinating and yeah, I, very fascinating. And yeah. also, as a, uh, for instance, that time in self might be a fractal, you know, as I said, we, we, we tend to think of time as linear, you know, and we go from A to B to C to D, you know, and uh, that's 12 o'clock, it's uh, well, 1 p.m., 2, 2 p.m., 3 p.m., you know, but maybe time does not basically have that structure at all. Maybe time is in a loop and then a loop and a loop and a loop. So, yeah. uh, so 1 o'clock uh, might be closer to 6 six o'clock than to three o'clock it might be because just we don't see the structure of time really and uh, if you go into for instance uh, string theory and m theory then you have the possibility to watch time also in some of the same that there are dimension within dimensions you know so so our uh, oversimplified understanding uh, a day-to-day -day understanding of time it's probably not uh, say telling the truth about uh, the nature of things yeah yeah we agree. people need to understand stand this stuff you don't need to understand every equation to kind of get something from it uh one of the comments out here natalie mosley says i used to come home randomly from university to surprise my mom but uh she always knew i was coming because the horse would stand <laughs> by the gate looking up the road about 40 minutes before i got there oh, wow and yeah that plays right into uh, sheldrake studies absolutely the Our first part. the first one who introduced me to the kind of uh, esoteric law was a, a young woman i was dating uh, when i was 21 and uh, she had uh, bought an old book norwegian book by a quite gifted psychic lady the the power of mind it's what's called quite a common title and um, so he she had read that book and she had a good friend that she was very closely connected to, to. and what uh, she had um, I, I, if I'm, I will see if I can explain this uh, very easily. She had sent telepathically and uh, an invitation to this friend, and she had told her, um, "I will now do the dishes, and then I will make some tea, and please come over to me." So she sent that invitation telepathically, and then she started to do the dishes, and she started to make tea, but no one came. And then she said, she uh, repeated the invitation, I have made tea, please come immediately now. Uh, but no one came. And then she said, okay, since you will not come over to me, I will come to you instead. So she went over to this friend that greeted her in the door with two cups of tea. <laughs> <laughs> so she had sabotaged the invitation, you know, and just to prove her points that she was really in tune, she had made ready tea for both of them when my friend came over. You know, that kind of demonstrations, if you are very intuitive, uh, these things are possible. Yeah, we agree. Oh, we We're definitely. constantly in each other's heads and we talk about this a lot. Yeah. I will just be thinking of the, the same random thing. Silly thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Silly things like all the time. And, you know, make mm. one of say something like oh we got to go do this in three months and i'm mm. 
she'll be like, oh, I was just thinking that. Yeah, or, or exactly. the reverse, you know. Get out of my exactly. head. Get out of my head. happens. <laughs> 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 And again, if we think of uh, consciousness as a shared mental internet, you are very good uh, connected on Facebook and Instagram and all the, say, spiritual social media you have. So uh, when he posts something, you will perceive it immediately. And with she posting, you will perceive it on your page immediately. You know, that's just a metaphor. But we have all this experience of, of, of being connected uh, daily via the internet. Therefore, I use that metaphor. That's right. And our phones and stuff. And we know, yes, when, you know, you get a text and you know who it is before you look at it or a phone mm. call, the phone rings and you're phone like, oh, rings, you know, yep. you know, I, I must tell you, uh, it was good. Uh, a friend of mine, an other friend of mine, uh, she's living in Thailand and she's a very intuitive person and she is, has a extremely good uh, connection with animals. You know, that's a deep intuitive thing. Uh, but uh, she was having an ex exam uh, two days ago and she had somehow missed what the exam was about. Uh, she had thought it was a new physiology, but in f fact, it was pharmacology. So when she entered the room with the exams and the papers and all thing. Oh, some, uh, heck, I have a red for the wrong subject. And uh, there was the, what would be the adverse effects of uh, serotonin, what would be the adverse effects of uh, melatonin, and what uh, the GABA co connections and blah, blah, blah. Quite uh, demanding stuff. But she somehow relaxed and tuned in and started, you know, just going with the flow, trying to download the answers from the mental internet. And she ended up answering correct uh, 18 out of 20 questions. Oh, wow. wow. She, she, she was uh, close to the top in her class and she had not read the subject. Oh, that's amazing. Wow, it's great. It is. Yeah, And uh, that was just two days ago. And she was stunned uh, herself because she didn't, uh, know how she did it. She, but as I said, she is a very natural intuitive, and uh, that uh, similar experience uh, I have interviewed in connection with my book. I've interviewed close to a hundred professional psychics um, from different traditions, from Sami tradition, you know, Native American tradition, uh, Jamaican tradition, Canadian tradition, also. And two of those psychics have uh, also told about that sitting on the exam and suddenly just knowing the answers and not being able to know where they're coming from. Uh, one of those got problems with the teacher uh, because the teacher said, you have to demonstrate. You cannot just give the answer. You have to demonstrate how did you find that answer. And that she could know, uh, do you know. But so, yeah. So the information is all there. And if you're sensitive, you can download it. It's right there. And it's kind of similar Absolutely. to something like uh, people talk about the Akashic Records, you know, being this record of everything yes. that happened, is happening, and will happen. Being just an accessible thing, almost like a yes. library or a book, you know, a person can mm. mentally go to. You know, I love that imagery. And one of the things I really love about about your book we've talked about some heady topics uh like quantum physics and things of, of that nature but you break it down very much in layman's terms so this is not a hard book to read folks you know if you're not well read on those subjects um uh, terry just breaks this down in a way that I, it's a page burner it really is like you'll go through this you'll learn a lot one of the topics that i really liked and maybe we can wrap up with was uh, psychic um archaeology yes um that's a uh, intriguing subject and um one of the say the famous uh, most famous within there is a uh, canadian professor uh, norman emerson and he was uh, the chairman of the canadian archaeological society uh, he passed away some uh, decades ago but uh, he has excavated uh, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, uh, what is called uh, um, say villages from uh, the First Nations people in Canada. Uh, and uh, he uh, was in a party where was introduced to an uh, impressive psychic called George McMullen. And George McMullen, he passed away a few years ago. He became quite old. And uh, what was uh, wondrous about McMullen, that he was able to, if someone gave him a kind of, um, say, an artifact, it could be a, 
an old vase or a ring or a coin or whatever, he would be able to just feel and then suddenly download information connected. Uh, who had made this? Where was it from? How old was it? What? How did it end up in Canada? And all that kind of things. Uh, that is an ability. Uh, we can call it clairvoyance, of course, uh, but a kind of special case of clairvoyance. It's called uh, psychometrics. Um, so you are somehow doing the metrics of that thing with your psychic abilities. That's so amazing. and and uh, and first uh, it was just kind of party game, you know, because people, oh yeah, that was kind of a uh, pipe, and that was kind of this, uh, and uh, this uh, was an arrowhead was used for hunting that kind of deer, but not that kind of deer, and so. So, uh, but then uh, Emerson thought, okay, maybe that is uh, my, this guy uh, guy might be not just. Uh, uh, funny in parties, but perhaps he could uh, assist my uh, excavation as well. So he brought uh, uh, George McMullen to, to a different um, say digging fields where they had some projects going on and he was able to locate uh, much, uh, say not yet unearthed stuff. He could say, oh, over there is a, uh, had been a palisade, and there they had a little fortress, and it was about 50 yards. And so, and when they started digging, they usually always, I think it was about 80% uh, percent of the cases, uh, the information proved correct. So that is very, uh, and how did he do that? He didn't know that, but he had some, some, times it just came to him like visions and he also had kind of what we could name spiritual context it was kind of three different voices or something beings entities that he was communicating with also uh, who, who would tell him uh, uh, different things about these excavations and so so that is a very and uh, as i said this was not just a, a kind of old hippie on lsd this was a professor norman emerson uh, so uh, and he was the chairman of the canadian archaeological society and he is in fact written uh, some essays about it so that is a very say important person within the field of uh, uh, of um, of psychic archaeology and then of course we have uh, stefan schwartz uh, who he is a great researcher in the paranormal and he has done uh, in uh, alexandria uh, in a famous um, uh, there was a famous harbor. Uh, Alexander is in Egypt. He uh, conducted uh, 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 several uh, archaeological excavation on the bottom of the sea with the help of, of uh, psychics. I think he had 11 psychics and uh, among others, this George McMullen. And she, uh, he also had a woman that had uh, participating in the, in the Stargate program, the American military program called uh, Hella Hamid. Uh, she was a photographer. Uh, so uh, George McMullen and Hella Hamid, I think they were the two most central, but th there were if I don't remember wrong, nine others as well. And they did find lots of historical things and they documented these finds with um, with the camera. And uh, about 10 years later, it was an international expedition confirming, uh, say, and going, literally speaking, diving deeper into the matter. And today it's possible for, for scuba divers to follow a route and to, to watch some of the artifacts they found on, 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 on the bottom of the sea. So that is also a famous case. And I mentioned also um, um, Glastonbury, which is a very famous old uh, monastery in England that was also excavated uh, after, uh, say, there was a kind of trans medium receiving messages from the watchers, which was a group of spirits that somehow felt obliged to watch over this place and provide information to the archaeologist uh, uh, digging there. And also uh, quite recently, there was this uh, find uh, of uh, the skeleton of Richard III, uh, which is quite famous from the Shakespeare play, uh, my horse, my horse, my kingdom from a horse. That was Richard uh, III saying before he fell off his horse and, and, and was killed. But he had been disappeared. Uh, I thought 400 years or even for, was it 500 years I don't remember exact year now but um, uh, then it was um, a, a amateur archaeologist and script uh, writer uh, Scottish 
uh, who, who um, Philippa Langley is her name, and she felt a, a strong haunch. Uh, she was in a parking lot and she felt a strong haunch. Here is Richard Burrid. And because she was a resourceful person, she was able to get kind of license and get start an excavation. And one meter under the exact spot she had marked for, they found a skeleton. And it was tested um, uh, genetically uh, with the DNA uh, up against uh, living relatives from the sister, Anne of York, the sister of Richard III. And it was a 99 Point nine 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 hit. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. read so, that story. And, it was really cool. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they even uh, arranged for a reburial of Richard in the Cathedral of Le Leicester. So that means they are sure this was really Richard. So this, uh, these are some examples of psychic archaeology. It's amazing. Excellent, excellent. I see. Uh, Robin, thank you for posting the Canadian Amazon link for the book. The book, of course, is called A Short History of Nearly, and I've put nearly in parentheses, Everything Paranormal. Um, the subtitle there is Our Secret Powers, Telepathy, uh, Clairvoyance, and Precognition. It is available on Amazon. There's another link here. I'm going to put that up. And uh, thank you guys for, for putting those links up. We appreciate thank it. You. But basically, you can find it very, yeah, yeah, very thanks easily. So thanks, and uh, we can personally attest, like, this is a really good book. And, again, it, it's not a book that it's overly complicated, like, oh, my God, I'm never going to get it. You're going to yeah. learn things. There are subjects in here that I'm pretty well read on, and I learned, I learned stuff. There were stories in there I didn't know, and I was like, wow. And, of course, there's other aspects, like, uh, like the psychic archaeology yes, that, I, I, that I thought was so fascinating. I had no idea that like people were magic. using psychic abilities to, to find relics and lost things. You wouldn't even think about that. But mm -hmm. there it is. There's you know, Gail. It happens. Speaking oh, yeah. Speaking of you, girl. There's Gail. We mentioned you tonight, we Gail. Small, it. medium, and large. We love you, love too. Love you. Uh, Gail was the, the subject of, of Dean Radio. Yeah, I Rock. remember you mentioned her, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes. We also, the book contains uh, some stuff from Norway. We have a tradition with psychics and healers or in Norway. I mentioned a quite famous guy that uh, he has received uh, uh, more than 40,000 patients. And he has also helped the Red Cross and the police finding missing persons on several occasions. It's, he's very well documented. And uh, I've spoken to him several times. And uh, he's so impressive. He passed away last year. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. But but I, I bring some quite fascinating anecdotes about his uh, amazing abilities yeah yeah goodness. excellent excellent well i do recommend everybody go out there it seems to be a little confusion about the links but if you just go on amazon and search yes. for this uh terry simonson um your your first name is spelled t-e-r-j-e -E. some people yes. will hear this as a podcast just so you know uh, and it won't have the visual and uh simonson is spelled s-i-m-o-n-s-e-n uh, go and look for his book. Just buy like, it. You'll love it. Quick uh, comment after that, please. And uh, Gail says, having dinner with Dean on Tuesday. There you go. So, oh, great. <laughs> Russell Targ, she speaks to every day. I, so. I'm envious of her. We, yeah, are, I, too. we are too. <laughs> Who doesn't follow us? Uh, Dean, Dean is really a great guy. He's helped me uh, getting a little scholarship, and uh, so uh, he is a great researcher and a great person. So that's wonderful. That's mm -hmm. wonderful you did that. Excellent. Thank I guess you. the Psy Squad in California. They worked over thirty years of police working on uh, missing persons. Bev Yeager. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yes, thank uh, you again. Yes, Ken. Okay, Ken, thank you for having show. me. We really appreciate it. And uh, go out, yes. buy the book. Let us Please. know what you think. And uh, follow Terry on Facebook is another place to find you. Any other places you want people to go? Uh, well, uh, the book has a little page, uh, page on Facebook, as you said. So you, you can check out, the, uh, out there are some interviews and also some podcasts on Spotify if they find my name. Uh, and uh, there should be 20 podcasts or something like that. I think so. They, sure. If they're interested. Podcasts yes. that you hosted or uh, shows you're on like I um, more like uh, say it's quite similar to your shows and mm -hmm. also a d different kind of uh, some uh, more collective events as well yeah mm -hmm. oh great yep. yep this will be out there on Spotify and anywhere you get uh, podcasts uh, yes. so look for that if you uh, are looking to catch up and also whatever 
platform you're watching us now or listening to us mm -hmm. go into the archives because we talked to terry about a year ago yes, we did. and we tried to cover some different things so um you get a real good feel for the book and uh what terry is about and your own personal stories i think we're more on that first uh interview so yes, thank you again for right. joining us. uh we know it's Thanks late enough for having me. we're in norway no, you're very welcome thank have you. a great night thank you so much bye pull you out of the stream we'll be right with you and uh, we got to wrap things up because we're on our way to Harrisville, going to the country house, going to the country house. Thank you, Shannon and yes. MJ. We much, very much appreciate it. Thank you, everyone in the audience tonight for your, your comments. And um, if we didn't get to them all, we apologize. But uh, we do appreciate it. And thank you for watching and listening. Um, have a great weekend, guys. We'll see you next Thursday. Bye.